And I think he's going to say a few words up here before he steps back in the booth to run you through a few words. So uh, please welcome Guy Richard Smith. So I just want to give you some background on uh, me. Um, it's going to, my, my project is a little fragmented, so it's going to jump between a few different disciplines. Um, which, uh, so when I get back there, I'm going to be jumping between the static arts and performance work. Uh, is that my mic making those noises? No. Um, and video, and then a whole music project I worked on. And so we're going to have to skip through a few things. I hope you'll bear with me. You'll have to kind of switch modes of uh, reception. Um, so I was uh, born and raised in New York City. Um, uh, um, in in uh, Morningside Heights, which is 120th Street. And uh, I had academic parents. Um, my dad was a Dutch immigrant who was, who was uh, uh, teaching history at Columbia. And uh, so I grew up in a home. Uh, he came out of a tradition uh, of social historian. Uh, um, he sort of adulated a, 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 a man named Panofsky, who it was a, I mean, a, a sort of a holistic way of, of approaching history. And so nothing in our household was ever uh, without an acknowledgement of other things. Uh, you couldn't just have painting, you couldn't just have music, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't talk about painting without talking about the social structures that uh, made uh, painting, let's say, 17th century Netherlands uh, um, so, so popular and so effective. Um, and so, in a, in a funny way, I, I was never able to really concentrate on one thing. Um, uh, and that I've always, I've, I've always it's, it, he, there was a very sort of Catholic understanding of how everything interrelated. Um, I ended up going to the High School of Music and Art, uh, which had just conglomerated with the High School of Performing Arts, which was the Fame School. And the show was actually on television at the time, uh, but there was no art students in the show, so we didn't have anything to really crow to, to sing about. <laughs> but it was an amazing environment uh, in 80s New York. Um, to be in this kind of hop out, I mean, the kids would really, in fact, sing in the cafeteria. Uh, and it was very free. And I, I, I remember being there and just going like, wow, those musicians seem like they're having a really good time. Uh, oh, wow, like those actors, they look like they're having a really good time. Um, the vocal students, the dancers, everyone seemed to have been having a really good time. And I became kind of infected with uh, their enjoyment of their own art, even while I was sitting there drawing. And, and um, at the same time, I was becoming fascinated with uh, people like Daumier and Goya, and people who approached art in a very um, outside of the studio kind of way. Uh, and then I have another part of me, which is uh, my dad was, being Dutch, they, um, uh, they're incredibly practical people. And uh, one of the worst things you can be in the Netherlands is a showboat. In fact, it's the, you know, if, if, if you describe someone as a, big sh a real showboat, that is like, you just cast them into hell. Um, it, it's just like you're nothing, you, you, you just want to be, the, there's a saying in the Netherlands, uh, um, uh, which means uh, act normal, that's crazy enough. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I have, in my own incredibly earnest approach to art, and I wanted to be a, 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 a politically active painter. I, I, I admired you know, Leon Golub and, um, uh, um, as I said earlier, Daumier, and, 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 and those, those social, social realists and stuff. But at the same time, I had this deep shame about being this incredibly earnest and uh, uh, 
serious about my work. And in fact, it was so great to me that I um, uh, really could see it in others and despised them for their self-seriousness. Uh, and so my work toggles often between this natural inclination of mine to be self-serious and then a total uh, disgust at being self-serious. Um, another thing happened to me. I was growing up on 120th Street in an Irish-American neighborhood, um, uh, which had one park separating us from Harlem proper. This is the 1970s and 80s. And um, uh, the black kids leave me, left me alone because they thought I was Irish. But the Irish kids knew I wasn't Irish. <laughs> And so it was um, really, there was a constant, it was still an ethnic New York where you, you, know, you knew when you had left an Irish neighborhood because you weren't being chased anymore. That, you, know, you knew that you left an Italian and American neighborhood because that had stopped. Uh, and you didn't see Marines in the front lawn. Um, so I became, a way of surviving in this situation was to become the funny guy. I uh, would make these uh, uh, Irish big brothers of the Megans and the Kathleen's I knew, who were high on mescaline, laugh. Um, and they kind of left me alone, mo mostly. Uh, or at least when they fucked with me, it was, so it was minimized by my ability to give them a chuckle. Um, and so this became a, like a huge defense for me, and I found that it worked in a lot of circumstances. Um, if I was funny uh, uh, with women, they liked me. Uh, if I was funny with um, uh, colleagues, uh, classmates, it got me out of a lot of situations because I was not a good student or a good athlete or any of the things that are generally required in that era of your, that part of your life. Um, so I'm going to start the, uh, the, the, the kind of pictorial thing. But I, I, so I, I decided that you know, maybe fine arts wasn't the best thing for me, because how could you be effective as a, as politically uh, by making big paintings? And so I decided I was going to become an illustrator. And I went to Parsons uh, with the plan of becoming an illustrator. But then went to study the year at the Riefeld Academy in Amsterdam, where I realized I had no interest in being an illustrator. Uh, it was the furthest thing from my desire. So I came back and went to Rutgers, which had a uh, uh, Rutgers University of New Jersey, which had had a, a, a grand tradition of um, um, uh, sorry, the, the political the 60s crap. The Dada, it was Dada inspired movement. The Americans, thank you, Floxus. Thank you. Um, and Leon Gallup was, uh, they had a good tradition with that. They, uh, Leon Gallup was teaching there. Um, uh, it had a, uh, uh, a lot of very socially active artists. And so I was very attracted to that. Very soon into that, it became, uh, as we were sitting there criti criti critiquing painting, I realized I was like, well, you know what? I've always been this kind of performer. Why don't I try that? And I experimented with performance, and I developed a character named Jonathan Grossmallerman, uh, which means big painter man in German. And he was this sort of like, basically, he was Julian Schnabel, who at the time we all knew to despise. Um, and, and, and also, frankly, a lot of these, I was 25, and he was basically every older artist that I did not want to become, but now I have a very sort of affectionate feeling towards because I realize how hard it really is. But at the time, it was going to be super easy, and they, all, they were all fuck-ups. Um, so uh, I started performing, uh, 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 making short videos of, of him delivering stand-up, and he was just this sort of ball of anxiety and, and um, um, uh, sort of jokes that were so bad that they were funny. They, 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 there was no uh, applause or laughter in the videos. Um, 
I, and that became quite actually quite popular. I never really broke through with this character. And I, so I broke through so much that um, uh, you know, I was reviewed in the Times, and that was very good. And then I started being asked to do this character everywhere, and I became known as the stand-up guy. And I didn't want to become the stand-up guy. I, I had all these plans. And um, so I developed another character named Maxi Gaia, and he was a lead singer of this band, and he was essentially the opposite of Jonathan Gross Marman's um, approach to power. Uh, he was all, uh, uh, he was confident. Uh, at, at everything Gross Marman failed at, he survived uh, and, and, um, at. Uh, he, um, and that became a band uh, that I, I started to, I, I created uh, rock operas. Um, uh, one was called Nausea 2. Well, the first one was called The Ballad of Bad Orpheus, where he plays a evil ship captain who keeps his crew from mutiny with his golden voice. Uh, and the next one was Nausea 2, which was a full feature and was shown at the MoMA um, uh, called Nausea 2. Uh, and that was about two adult film stars who become crippled with doubt. Um, and then that kind of developed into a real band, and I toured Europe and uh, the Americas. Uh, uh, with that for some time. Um, and that became kind of all, all encompassing, all engrossing. Uh, I, at the same time though, I was continuing a, um, uh, a painting um, discipline. And uh, I was doing this series called, uh, 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 based on the New York Times. And I'll show you those as we start. Um, and I found that I was constantly running out of money. I didn't have money to paint paintings, uh, oil paintings on canvas. And I found that watercolor had this great um, ability to, I, I could get my idea out, get it out there, and not uh, worry about it, it bankrupting me. Um, and not worry about it because I had to work a job, and so I could come home, and in, in the amount of time I had at home, I could still create these things. Um, so I'm going to, uh, there's a microphone in there, right? Mm -hmm. okay, so I'm going to, we're going to bounce uh, through these things. Um, right, right now. Grab my beer. We're going to start off with some early 90s, mid 90s uh, watercolors. Um, where I would, uh, I, I was using my, uh, History and okay. uh, uh, using my my abilities uh, slow connection. So we're gonna keep it like that. I was basically dealing with my fears and hopes and dreams. That says you are my hero. Mm -hmm. This is a self-portrait as Gross Mollerman. This is a favorite of mine. Uh, good God, yes, that does sound like very self-destructive behavior. Do you want to do loads of crystal methadone and have unprotected sex right now? Approach <laughs> <laughs> your grad school like the old left. So I was still, I was still working through grad school. <laughs> it was uh, the mid '90s and a um, the height of. Well, the, the original height of political correctness, and there were a lot of things being worked through by a lot of people. Uh, Dear Mary, your love is arbitrary. I can do everything alone. So while I was doing this, I was also developing this character, John Gross Um And uh, performing him right now. I'm not going to show you any of the early ones because they're, because I'm going to show you a later iteration. 
But I, I literally made hundreds of, of these guys here. Um, so, in the meantime, uh, so, so then, from that, uh, let's see. I started these New York Times pieces, and this is a, a, a semi-recent one. Um, but I would do front pages, and there's a couple of up upstairs that are recent ones. This one is an example that I did um, uh, where I, I created the whole New York Times, uh, pay, uh, about 40 pages. Um, and you know, there's, there's different kinds of artists. There's, and I'm, one thing I kind of made peace with was that I was the storytelling type of artist. Um, I really need, uh, I, I'm fascinated by color and composition and stuff like that, but I really need a hook of a narrative um, uh, to keep me going, even if it's in a fragmented way. Um, so some, some, you know, Pope bitterly blames his tools. Uh, I've always wondered about studio drummers. Um, and there's the sadness of the studio drummer. Um, Another botched coastal evacuation. Senators grilled nominee over perceived social slight. So they became these sort of personal, uh, almost like a diary, like an interior monologue about what I was reading uh, in the news on any given day. Um, Staring and poor's entire New York office dead. Uh, Merrill Lynch issues apology. Extreme embalming. Um, so in these these pieces were my financially speaking were my bread and butter for quite some time. Um, and at the same time, while I'm doing these, I became you know much more serious about. Uh, the music, and let's see, I think it's, uh, no, sorry. And here's an example of, of that world. Oh, I'm not getting, is there no sound? Is there video sound? gemacht äh, von dem das berühmte Video äh, Artist Lament. Äh, ja, kannst du ein bisschen etwas erzählen? Also es ist ein, ein sehr angstiger Dunkelvideo. Äh, es ist äh, für mich ganz wichtig, weil ich habe es all, ich habe alles gemacht. <lacht> äh, ich habe es äh, geschossen und geschnitten. Äh, äh, eine, es ist sehr äh, weil es, es wurde von dieser Angst vor dem Krieg auch äh, diese, genau. diese Atmosphäre der Verfolgung äh, und ja, klar. Paranoia und, ja. und so Bärenflüsse. Ja. Ja, 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 ja. ja, Willkommen in Europa, willkommen in der Schweiz, Maxi ja. Gall. Äh, wir schauen uns äh, dein berühmtes Video Argus Lament an und äh, das ist auch schon das Ende der Show. Ciao zusammen. Danke, dass Sie da waren. Sie bleiben da mal bei Iris Lemons.
And she says, Assistant, 
uh, who, um, uh, who you'll see now. Yeah. 
You woke up this morning covered in vomit. You wake up every morning covered in vomit. You go into the bathroom to sit down to pee so that you can weep. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to, but it's a high-pitched weep that really carries like, <laughs> so anyway, ask him, all right, all right, all right. All right. All right. Hey, Mike, what's up? Just, uh, doing my rounds. <laughs> Finish that leak in 2L. You remember 2L? Oh, wasn't that your apartment? That was my apartment. Back before the art world turned its back on me, uh, a job as a building's handyman. Moving into a cozy room next to the boiler, where at least it's always warm. I'm glad you stopped by. Oh, I'll, I'll fix that damn window. No, no, it's not the window. I have a question for you, actually. Well, it's just not about that smell and where it's coming from. No, it's actually it's about pain. Pain. You want to ask me a question about pain? Yeah. Okay. I'm thinking of switching up my whole subject matter. No more fucking? That's like your thing, though. It's like you're the fucking pain man. Well, there comes a time when any person has to, you know, change it up a little bit. Make it different. Yeah, who'll put you up to this? Nobody. Don't put me up to it. I just think I'm sick of candy fucking all the time. What the hell else are you going to paint? I don't know. That's what I'm asking you. Okay. Well, let's see. Well, what about an obsession? That's a good place to start. What are you obsessed with? Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, Have you ever what? thought about what if you sneak the fucking in subtly? That way people won't notice. You know, Neil, that's not a bad idea. It's a good place to start. I thought you were asking me. I think it, I think it'd be very mature. You know, it's all class. I thought like you had to hit everyone over the head with the fucking bit. I thought you wanted to know what I thought. I, I like it. It's a good a starting point. A good starting point. I'll be in my room if anybody needs me. Next to the boiler. <laughs> yeah. You can find a historical context for the fucking. Yeah. Who doesn't like fucking in history? Oh, back to the Russians. Trust the cyclists. What? Oh. Hey, Louise. Oh, oh, your purse? No, no, I'm, I'm pretty sure I saw you take it with you when you left. Oh, hey, no, you're right, here it is. Yeah, yeah, you can stop by and pick it up anytime you want. Well, it'll be lovely to see you, too. <laughs> yeah, all right, say what? No, Gross Mollerman's not trying to kill me. Okay. Bye. Huh. What a strange way to end a phone conversation with a whispered warning. Oh, that just means she cares about you. I got a lot to learn about the ways of love. God damn it, I can't think of any fucking history. I mean, did people even fuck in history? <laughs> All right. So then, thank you. Um, so I, I, I shot five episodes of that, which was uh, quite a grueling, I'm see, five. Episode five. Uh, you can see them all on GuyRichardSmith.com. Um, dealing with this, I, I, I bit off quite a bit with this, and the post-production of it was endless. I did all the editing myself, but then we did um, color corrects and, and uh, uh, we got uh, sound uh, guys to do all the Foley sound. And all of that I was not in control of, or at least I wasn't in control of the way one would be in control of painting. 
And so at that point, I started, uh, in order to feel that I wasn't sinking, I started this Mountain of Skulls project, where at least by the end of each day, I had painted something. Um, and you can see a number of those upstairs. Um, they are currently, when I started, at, uh, started out, I wanted to do uh, 400. Um, and if you will, I, I, when I was 20, I, I, I went to school in the Netherlands and the Velvet Revolution happened and so Czechoslovakia was open and we went to Prague and outside of Prague there's a, 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 an ossuary uh, where there's a, a church that's basically just totally decorated with skulls and bones and a chandelier made out of them. And I remember looking at these piles of skulls, pyramids of skulls everywhere, and really the skulls are just, they're impossible to uh, empathize with. I mean, they're just these sort of symbols. Um, and to attach that to a living person who had been just like you or I, was very difficult for me. And um, I remember at some point just deciding one of the skulls was, had been possibly the town baker. Um, they had been skulls that they had found while they were digging the foundation for the church had turned out to be for, all from the plague. Um, and when I decided that one was possibly the town baker, it provided the possibility of having him, him having relationships with everyone around him. And it made it easier for me to uh, imagine all these people. That they're, they're people like us who, you know, had love affairs, uh, cheated on one another, um, owed people money, um, uh, had uh, strange, uh, felt spite, um, um, uh, had animosity towards one another. And um, so I felt I, I wanted to give them each sort of that title, uh, uh, some sort of sum up. Um, and I wanted to, there to be at least 400 of them, ultimately, because that's what, to me, a small town in the Middle Ages might have been uh, like. And I couldn't, I didn't want to do more than that because that seemed insane. I've reached 400 now, and I can't see it stopping um, because I keep coming up with them. Um, and there'll be a book released uh, uh, in January of, of that. Um, so, uh, as I was sort of feeling I had to back away from this project, um, uh, you know, a, a number of the images that I created for the New York Times pieces, or, uh, and there were literally hundreds of them, and certain things started to repeat. Um, and they were, they'd all been these tiny little watercolors. And I had this fantasy of making them into, uh, and, and, and in, in being little watercolors, they were very intimate. There was an intimacy to them. And I wanted to see how those, uh, those paintings would translate if they were suddenly on 9 by 12 tarp, uh, canvas tarp. Um, and so that's what you see uh, upstairs. Um, uh, and those are all quite literally like they've been done in the last year. Um, and it's been really exciting because I've worked small for so long, uh, doing, um, uh, you know, painting in a way that makes my shoulder hurt by the end of the afternoon. Um, uh, painting on a, grand, a grander scale, but also a grander time scale. So um, I'm going to end it here. I'll show you just a few more of these. And, um, and I'm going to run out. And you can ask me questions if anyone has them.
I know it's, it's, it, it jumps around a lot, and it, sometimes it might not be clear what the connections are. Uh, um, but I think as, as my career, or as, I, as my discipline moves along, I think it becomes more clear. Um, but does anyone have any questions? I noticed uh, you have some of the really big paintings upstairs, but you didn't talk about those. Yeah, well, so, so I, was, I was just saying that at the end that I had, you know, I've been using, when I started the New York Times series, uh, each, each page would have about four images. And so I, I, uh, uh, I was producing quite a lot of them. And certain images would kind of pop up again and again. And, uh, interactions between people and stuff. And I've always been sort of obsessed with interactions between people and uh, what, what they mean, subtext, stuff like that. And um, uh, so things that stuck in my mind, I was like, you know, I, I wonder if this strange, uh, these strange little images, what would that look like if they were turned into nine foot by 12 foot kind of um, a monumental paintings? Uh, what would the what would happen with that intimacy? Uh, how would that make it strange, or uh, would it diminish things, or uh, um, uh, would it make it would it heighten the strangeness? Um, and I also wanted to try uh, to, to simply create a problem for myself to approach it in the same kind of. Uh, um, off-the-cuff way that I handle my watercolors, uh, which over the last 20 years I've become, I feel like uh, I've gotten quite good at. And so there, and there, there's certain things about certain mediums that um, uh, you know, each each medium has a strength. And I found that with with oil painting, for for instance, I would uh, I would get very fussy because you could just fix it forever. Um, and watercolors, you really, it, it, their power diminishes the more you fuss over them, I find. And I found with acrylic, it had that same panicked performative aspect, because once they dry, you couldn't back up. Um, uh, you couldn't get that same wet on wet quality. You, couldn't, you wouldn't get the same gesture. Uh, and I started to, and it, I'd always felt that sort of acrylic had this kind of resting bitch face where it would just, you know, you'd be like, oh, that looks great, and then it would just kind of like turn into this flat thing, and, and, and you'd be like, damn you! Um, and then I started to love that about it, and, uh, and it stops, it, uh, I, could, I felt like I could be, uh, I could approach it in more the way that I was approaching the watercolors, where they didn't have to be um, this perfect thing at the end it could be. Uh, I could have my that my hand with it. Some of it could be awkward. There could be some wonderful little spots, and then there could be these kinds of expanses of slightly awkward area. And um, um, and it would be and, and and the quality that I felt that I was bringing to my watercolors would would. Uh, on some level, I mean, it's not going to be the same, but on some level, tra be transposed to those larger pieces. Uh, and that's why I also, you know, I didn't, um, they're not framed, and they're the shape of the canvas, uh, because I've worked on paper for so long, and I've really fallen in love with the way paper does its thing. Um, and I, when things get square, and they feel trapped to me, and it's just a personal, thing, uh, but I, I love the idea that these could be thrown on the ground or um, tied around a pole or, or um, I, I'm not afraid of them as the way, the way I would be by something painted on a, an incredibly expensive uh, uh, stretch of bars, that, you know. Um, but I, I've had so much fun with them, I can't, I, I just, I, I could, uh, They're really where my head's at now. And they're so hard for me to make because my studio is so small, I can literally, I have to <coughs> take a picture of them with my iPhone to get a sense of what they look like from 10 feet away. You know, it's, it's uh, 
So I've been seeing them here. It's, just, it's the first time I've seen them together. It's just the first time I've stepped as far away from them as I have. I've never been able to show them in an art uh, studio visit because I can only get one on the wall at any time. So that was a very long, boring studio visit for whoever came in. Uh, once I had you know, several sex packs ready for them. Um, anybody else? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that those works upstairs to me, and maybe thinking about your kind of body of work, remind me a little bit more of, or I guess I'm curious about the idea of spectacle, and um, um, they kind of also sort of feel a little bit like sideshow canvas banners that are uh -huh. probably around the same size and are not stretched, and kind of yeah, yeah, like yeah. that when they're, when they're put out, and sort of that relationship between kind of that displaced uh, newspaper photograph or whatever that carrot is, right, to get you into that article or into that current spectacle. Right. I, I didn't know if that was at all part of the movie. Well, for, for me, I mean, what I love about comedy and what I love about um, pop music um, is, and what I love about sitcoms, uh, it, that you get these basic structures and there's a basic pull in and you work within that system, uh, and you fill that system. And this is the same in painting. So I, I, I'm very, I, I really love uh, that idea of entertainment. I don't feel that that's a bad thing, and I love the idea of enticement. Uh, I I get bored super easily. Um, So like, I, I love that idea that of a side show. <laughs> that's that's really nice. Uh, but it, it's definitely along the lines of what I'm, what's in my mind. I I, I um, that's an interesting way to think about it. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna. You know, I look forward to watching all the sitcom episodes. Did you ever? Did they ever develop a following? Like, have you ever counted views or? You know, did, were, were they sort of like a cult favorite among the art crowd in New York? Um, they, uh, unfortunately, I finished them, and they were actually, I, I had a number of uh, screenings lined up, one in L.A. Uh, at the Ace Hotel, and there was going to be all these producers there. Um, and it was two days after the last election. And I remember I was on a flight out of New York the morning after the election, and I was just sort of like a zombie. Everyone on the flight was a zombie. Yeah. And it felt so silly <laughs> uh, trying to ask some people to come see something at the time um, that uh, it was a, a sadly missed opportunity. Uh, there are, so that's to Trump is to blame for that. To, I blame Trump. Uh, I yeah, literally like the, the nightmare show of the Ace and. Uh, you know, a few people came. It was very sweet of them, but like the demonstration went right, right by the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. And yeah, and one of the one of the coast Jim's camera who plays uh, Gross Norman's girlfriend uh, lives out there, and she like left the screening to go join the demonstration. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, so we're, I'm actually kind of about to restart. I have a number of screenings set up uh, soon. Um, uh, one in New York on Sunday, actually. So we're we're kind of s starting to uh, run it up again because it's it feels like, um, however absurd, at least a more hopeful period and uh, one where I I don't feel dumb talking about my comedy show. Um, I, I there, there there are people. It, it's something that people in grad school sit around and watch. I found out. Uh, <laughs> Um, but it's not something I, yeah, so in the last, since it happened, you know, it, it's very, this is the problem with my overarching co uh, concept is that in some ways it's been a way of hiding behind, uh, when I reach a problem like how to sell a sitcom to, to, uh, uh, a production company, for instance. 
It's really hard, it's obnoxious, it's annoying. And somehow, it's always right then that I suddenly come up with the idea to do paint skulls. And then that becomes my kind of obsession. And so when, and it's really neat in terms of when I, I I'm never depressed because I always have <laughs> some, some project, but often I don't, uh, uh, when I hit a wall, I'm like, oh, then I'll work on this other project. And that's how I get through the day. And so I get a lot of work done. It doesn't always, uh, um, the hard part of it, which is calling production companies and who don't want to talk to you and <laughs> trying to set up meetings that they don't want to have and uh, then cancel. You know, it, it's, uh, that part is very difficult. But, uh, but um, I just set up like three, three screenings coming up very soon and we're, we, I've, I've, we're, we're about to really kind of start again, trying to get it around because, uh, the, 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 you know, that, so that's the second episode. They just get funnier. They're, by the end, we were so on uh, with each other that, uh, and it gets so absurd. And I, 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 you know, I wrote them all. I'm really proud of how the storylines intertwine and, and the callbacks and all, you know, we followed all these, the, the basic rules of sitcoms. And um, it's, it won't be a waste of your evening. <laughs> It comes to, to, to twenty to five episodes of twenty two minutes each, so that's what an hour and a half of your time. Um, and uh, you know there are worse ways to spend it, mm. watching it, most other TV. <laughs> Anybody else? Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Drinks upstairs. <laughs> <laughs>